So uh, I think we can start. Welcome everyone to this third SOLAS seminar, um, where we are going to hear uh, three presentations on the topic uh, about the ocean atmosphere exchange of aerosol particles, the impact on marine ecosystems. Um, I would like to introduce Professor Amadeo Suarez, who is the scientific coordinator of the Center for Environmental and Marine, in, and Marine Studies of the University of Aveiro. Uh, to say a few words, uh, please, Professor, the stage is yours, and thank you for being and joining us in this <laughs> in another session. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, in fact, it is. Uh, Myself, we should thank you, the Regina, as representative representative of the organizers, to invite me and to allow me to participate in another yet another session organized by this very active group. And I'm glad to know that uh, uh, there are uh, around 100 participants from uh, 35, 36 different countries. If I'm not uh, wrong, more, but, no. or more, more than this, which is. Uh, uh, an absolute success uh, uh, by all meanings, and uh, also shows that the, the team of the, the, the seminar is a very uh, uh, updated team uh, that is very uh, uh, important for uh, uh, everybody, uh, not only for the impact on the marine ecosystem, but also for the, the as, as a human species. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, that we should take care of our, uh, our environment, our marine environment, but it provides lots of services uh, like uh, energy keeping, CO2, CO2 trapping, food, which is very important for us. And uh, 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 of course, the, the, the question of the ocean atmosphere exchanges are also one of the key drivers of the the the, the climate equilibrium of this uh, planet Earth. So it is indeed my pleasure that uh, to see that we have a, 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 a very uh, uh, active group on these uh, thematics. And uh, uh, so I welcome everybody. And I hope that you, you enjoy the meeting and that uh, as a result of this, uh, we will have uh, uh, in the near future, one more project or two more projects with uh, a couple of more seminars uh, that allow us to uh, uh, progress in the, uh, this very important scientific topic. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being present and thank you for the invitation. And as uh, an head of CESAM, it is always a pleasure to see that uh, 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 notwithstanding uh, my uh, more or less active uh, role, uh, we have a very uh, good uh, group of uh, researchers and professors that are very active in their scientific areas as this workshop demonstrates. Thank you, Regina, and uh, those were the words that I intended to, to Thank give. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Um, also, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Lily from the Solar. Uh, please, Lily, uh, I would like to, uh, if you could make some a brief introduction on, on the Solar project, I would love. And the stage is yours, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Regina. I will stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. Of course. All right. So uh, thank you again, uh, Professor uh, Amadou and Regina. So uh, I'm Lily, the SOLAS Executive, uh, Deputy Executive Director. So on behalf of the SOLAS Scientific Steering Committee and the International Project Office, I would like to thank uh, the Center for Environmental and Marine Studies, University of Aveiro, and the Ambience Projects for hosting the third SOLAS seminar. Uh, actually, I see many participants here today. I mean, we, we met already last month at the SOLAS Open Science Conference in Cape Town. So I'm, I'm super happy to see you are here again, but 
I mean, if you feel too much or too frequent to see me, please let me know and we will try to arrange someone else to do this intro at the next seminar, but no guarantee. <laughs> anyway, welcome everyone. So for those who are not familiar with SOLAS yet, SOLAS is a research, a global research program dedicated to uh, achieve quantitative uh, understanding of RC interactions and of how this RC couple system affects and is affected by uh, climate and global change. The second phase of SOLAS program, which is from 2015 to 2025, is uh, organized around five core things, which are greenhouse gases and oceans, Earth interface and fluxes of mass and energies, uh, atmospheric deposition and ocean belt geochemistry in the connections between aerosols, clouds, and marine ecosystems, ocean belt geochemical controls on atmospheric chemistry. We uh, today's I, I think today's seminar uh, aligns uh, with some of the research questions of SOLAR theme three and four, and we also identified a number of important cross-cutting themes. Uh, such as integrate topics on upwelling system, polar oceans, Indian Ocean, climate intervention, and solar science and society. Uh, a scientific steering committee of uh, 17 members from 14 countries currently is uh, in, ch in charge of uh, providing scientific guidance or overseeing the development of SOLAS program with the support of a dual international project office currently hosted by the University of Galway and in Ireland and the State Laboratory of Marine Environmental Science in China. And for each of the SOLAS core themes and cross-cutting themes, there is an implementation team led by SOLAS SAC members. And via integration and synthesis of uh, international activities and the research uh, of the global scientific uh, networks, including the 31 uh, SOLAS national and regional networks. The implementation team update their implementation strategy every other year. And the version uh, of 2022 will be online by the end of this, this year. So please check SOLAS website to stay tuned about uh, research priorities of SOLAS science and activities that are being planned for the next two years. And SOLAS has been uh, collaborating with uh, international uh, research programs or international um, organizations, uh, such as we uh, collaborate, uh, we co-sponsor this international uh, integrated ocean carbon uh, research, IOCR working group together with CLIVA, INBER, IOCCP, GCP, under the auspices of IOC UNESCO. And we also co-sponsor this uh, biogeochemical exchange processes uh, between sea ice interfaces, uh, the BEPSI projects with uh, Click, SCAR, and the IIC. And we also endorse national or regional or international projects and the time series stations across the globe. And this ambience is one of our in-depth projects. So uh, everybody here, if your project is within the SOLAS domain, and if you are interested in applying for SOLAS endorsement, please feel free to reach out to the SOLAS IPO or visit the SOLAS website for more information. And here are some uh, new initiatives and activities that have been launched recently or to be launched shortly, including a master research program on ocean atmosphere and climate, in collaboration with the University of Galway. And we will shortly launch a regional panel in Southeast Asia and an early career scientist committee. Currently, we are organizing a midterm special issue in Elementa, which includes 12 review papers on uh, SOLAS core themes and cross cutting themes. So backed by ESA, ECHOS, OECS, OBPS, SOLAS initiates a best practice workshop series focus on the air sea eddy covariance uh, fluxes measurement. And for the solar science and the society team, uh, in addition to uh, those ship emissions, blue carbons and the air sea interface uh, science and the policies, we will also focus on harmful algae blooms, nature-based climate solutions, marine plastic, so on and so forth. And SOLAS has been dedicating to integrate ocean and the atmospheric science uh, to make sure the implementation of uh, science in policies and decision-making process, if, for example, via the UN activities. Together with Future Earth and other partners, 
SOLAS will be organizing a COP27 side event next month in Egypt on fire risk increase, a challenge for our system and the societies. And the solar sponsored project BEPSI will be also presented at COP27 at the Southern Ocean session of the Cryosphere uh, Pavilion for the, solar, uh, for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. SOLAS is working towards an endorsement application around the topics of aerosol exchange with marine ecosystem. And SOLAS has three major event series, the Summer School Open Science Conference and the Seminar Series. The ninth Solar Summer School will take place next June in Cape Verde. And today's seminar is the third one of the solar seminars. So if anyone here you are working with in SOLAS domain, and if you are interested in hosting a solar seminar, please write a message to me. And here are some more uh, upcoming SOLAS events. So if you are interested in any of the SOLAS scientific questions, activities, conference workshops, so please um, subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on social channels to be kept up to date. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for this very nice presentation. I think we have here many events that uh, are very interesting and uh, definitely for me <laughs> as one of the coordinator of one project that has been endorsed by SOLAS. So um, I think uh, uh, we can move forward in our seminar, right? Uh, so uh, let me uh, share again the opening slide just for a quick overview of the um, of the, uh, the, the following presentation. So this seminar um, is aligned with the core three, uh, with the core team three and core team four of SOLAS. Um, and uh, uh, it includes three presentations uh, addressing the different aspects of the ocean and atmosphere exchange of aerosol particles, namely the impact of coastal pollution and the, the anthropogenic stressors on marine ecosystems and the abundance and properties of marine uh, uh, aerosols. So um, uh, we have, uh, um, I think, uh, I, uh, what uh, uh, I suggest that the, the questions uh, uh, regarding the three presentation could be uh, uh, made on the open discussion, perhaps. But of course, uh, at the end of any presentation, if, if one of uh, any participant wants to make a, a question, please raise your virtual hand or uh, include the, your questions on the chat. Me or uh, Cheng Cheng is going to uh, help us, and uh, we can uh, uh, make these questions to um, to the to the speakers. Uh, I, I would like also to ask again the, our the participants to turn off the microphone. So I'm going to stop sharing the, this opening slide. And um, I'm going to present, uh, share my presentation. Uh, can you please confirm if you are seeing? Yes. Okay. Thanks. So. Um, I'm going to uh, present today the contribution of Ambience Project to, to these main questions about the impact of atmospheric stressors in coastal ecosystems. So um, this is not, uh, in this case, one woman show. I uh, have a, a, a group of colleagues from the University of Aveiro, from the Center for the Environmental and Marine, and Marine Studies, but also from the Department of Geosciences, and also a colleague from the uh, uh, New University of Lisbon. All of them have, have contributed to this to the development of the activities of this project. So today, uh, this presentation addresses four main points. Um, I'd like to present you a, a brief overview of the main and specific objectives of, uh, of the Ambience Project, the main findings in terms of the cameo diversity of the water soluble organic aerosols, and I'm going also to explain why we are very interested in this uh, specific uh, aerosol fraction. 
Um, some of the also the results that we have obtained in terms of the ecotoxicity uh, of the atmospheric particles and the future perspectives, because we are planning to have uh, ambience two in the short course. So um, ambience, this uh, word stands for the impact of atmospheric multi-stressors to coastal marine systems in a changing climate scenario. So we have two, uh, two, um, two main objectives of this project. Not only the characterization uh, of the uh, composition of air particles that, that, that arrive to the coastal surface waters and the impact of the different of the uh, of the deposition of the water soluble organic aerosols, not only on the chemical on the molecular composition, but also on the reactivity of the dissolved organic matter uh, uh, of the uh, seawater, but also how uh, these water soluble organic aerosols and also the dissolved organic matter can change the solubility and bioavailability of atmospheric trace metals. But these two uh, main objectives, they divided in six uh, specific objectives. Uh, and these specific objectives include not only the uh, assessing the structural features of the water soluble organic aerosols and also the trace metal uh, composition, um, but also assess how the, uh, the deposition um, uh, of these water soluble organic aerosols uh, change um, along the, the water column and what is their effect on the content of trace metals and the dissolved organic matter composition. Also, how this can change the, the persistence of the dissolved organic matter and what is the effects uh, on marine biota and how this could uh, change and impact the marine biodiversity. Um, well, as, you, uh, as we all know, uh, many projects have been impacted by the COVID-19 and the lockdown. This project was no, uh, was no different from, the, uh, from most uh, projects. So uh, we were able to uh, mainly focus on these three, uh, uh, on these three specific objectives. The other three are under development, still under development, and we hope in the uh, near future to have additional details on the, the, uh, on the other three uh, objectives. So in this presentation today, I am going to focus on, on these three uh, top, uh, specific objectives. The structural features of atmospheric organic aerosols, the molecular fingerprints, and how can they uh, help us to trace the the secondary or the continental or the marine sources, and what is the effect of these uh, atmospheric particles on uh, some uh, species of marine biota. So uh, why focusing on the water soluble organic fraction? So uh, besides being a high variable fraction of particulate organics, um, they are present in all sorts of aerosols from in urban areas, rural, coastal, and also marine aerosols. Not only they have an important role on the indirect aerosol effects, but they can also contribute to the absorption of solar radiation and also be uh, having an impact on direct aerosol effect. Um, they are also a source of organic carbon to surface waters. And this particular uh, reason is on the basis of this ambience project and was the main question, uh, the main scientific question that, uh, that was, that was the, um, the starting point to build this project. Uh, they can also, in terms of health effects, they can also uh, induce oxidative stress contributing to membrane disruption, lung cells membrane disruption. And um, I also would like to highlight this. Um, they can also as likely activate macrophages and uh, uh, limit their capacity to a subsequent inflammatory stimulus. This is something that we are also developing in our lab. Um, uh, so not only the effects on 
not only the, 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 the deposition of these organic aerosols on surface waters, but also on their health effects. So the scientific strategy uh, of this project, uh, it includes five, uh, five activities from, um, from uh, um, sampling, air particles and seawater sampling, uh, through chemical analysis of the collected samples, now, uh, an activity that is uh, totally dedicated to the structural analysis of these uh, water soil organic aerosols, and also the impact of uh, particle air particles deposition um, on uh, to the ocean surface, and we uh, assess this through aerosol seeding experiments um, in in the lab. Obviously, as any other project, we have an activity that runs through the entire project that is uh, uh, totally dedicated to the evaluation and dissemination of project data. Uh, so the study locations of this project. Uh, this project was originally focused on the west, on the most western European coast in Portugal. Uh, we have two uh, spots here. Um, uh, this one uh, um, in Aveiro, uh, in north part of Portugal, and in uh, Lisbon, in Tagus Estuary. Um, these two regions are uh, different. Uh, they are characterized by different uh, sources and also different levels of air pollution. Uh, but uh, as any other project, uh, the, the scientific goals also evolve. So uh, during uh, uh, the development of this project and uh, based on uh, ongoing collaboration with colleagues from um, uh, Tropos, the laboratory in Germany, and also uh, a colleague in the University of Cape Verde that uh, was here in the University of Aveiro, making uh, her PhD work uh, in my research group. Uh, so we included an, an additional uh, location in Cape Verde, where we also collected um, atmospheric particles and uh, uh, because of their ge of the, its geographical location Cape Verde is, is a very important spot in terms of the scientific goals of ambience project so the sampling dates that we are uh, that were chosen uh, for this uh, uh, study um, in Aveiro we have uh, different uh, seasonal uh, seasonal events we have the winter we have summer we have spring and then and then again summer different of different years um the sampling location uh, in uh, sampling dates in uh, lisbon uh, were a little bit later than uh, initially planned because of the lockdown due to covid and in cape verde we uh, selected three different months um, to uh, perform the sampling campaign. So just a quick overview. Uh, we have here a picture of the sampling uh, in Aveiro of the uh, high volume samplers and low volume samplers. Uh, this is a picture of a 24 hour uh, fine uh, uh, filter uh, collected with fine particles collected do, during 24 hour sampling campaign. We made an extraction just with water pure water and this is a picture of the aqueous extract. Um, we applied the freeze drying procedure to our different samples and here uh, uh, they are, it is a picture of the residue. It is a yellow, yellow residue. Um, and just to, just to show you the, the residue that we obtained for the Cape Weird uh, samples, uh, water soluble organic matter samples. So when you can see it already, they are they they have very different uh, uh, properties uh, in terms of physical properties. But also, also you, I'm going to show you in terms of the uh, chemical characteristics. They are also very different from the samples from um, collected in uh, Avai. So here, um, I'm going to also only focus here on the water soluble organic carbon and uh, the concentration, atmospheric concentration and also atmospheric concentration of fine particles. And uh, well, 
as you can see, um, I have here the, the, the samples from winter, summer, spring, and again, summer. Uh, we have higher values of both water soluble organic carbon and fine uh, air particles during winter, lower values in summer. Then again, we have in spring uh, here uh, uh, already uh, higher values, more in terms of water soluble organic carbon. And uh, we have here a peak in terms of uh, uh, fine uh, particles concentration, fine air particles concentration. And this is explained by the occurrence of forest fires during this period. Um, as you can see here on the side of this, on the right side of this uh, graph, I have here um, uh, representative pictures of their ma air mass trajectories during winter and spring and also during summer. During winter and spring, most of their masses come from the continental, uh, from the continent, European continent. And during the summer, during a uh, more warm uh, season, most of their masses come from the uh, maritime surroundings. Obviously, these different concentrations have an impact in terms of their contribution to the air, to the fine air particle mass. So as you can see here, I have median, minimum, and maximum numbers. Um, the maximum levels were uh, observed in winter samples and also in spring uh, samples. Um, this could be explained by the presence and the occurrence of emissions for, for from biomass burning for house heating. This is still very common here in Portugal. Um, uh, although my, th this may seem odd for spring, but as you can see here, we are talking about March, beginning of March. Um, and uh, that's, uh, we still have very cold nights here during in March. Uh, but then again, we start to see a decrease here in April. Uh, people, of course, uh, stop using uh, their uh, fireplaces in their houses to warm the, the, the houses. Uh, so this obviously reflects on these, uh, on these levels of water soluble organic matter. Uh, in Lisbon, uh, well, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot distinguish uh, we cannot see very, uh, a seasonal variation between summer and spring in in, in Lisbon. Uh, they are look very similar in terms of the of the uh, water soluble organic carbon concentration and also in terms of air air uh, air, uh, air uh, fine air, air particles also concentration. Um, so. In terms of the contribution of water soluble organic matter, what is interesting is that in summer, we have somehow here higher levels of water soluble organic carbon present in these samples. Well, this could be associated with the fact that uh, in summer we have a more uh, oxidative, more photooxidative uh, oxidation reactions than um, uh, the, the the amount of secondary organic aerosols are typically higher during this um, during summer. Um, well, in Cape Verde, well, we were uh, very surprised by the results that we have obtained because when we think about Cape Verde, we uh, uh, perhaps the first thought is a more clean, a more pristine environment. Well. Actually, we did not observe that pristine environment in this sampling location. Um, first of all, uh, the most, uh, uh, most uh, logical result is the, uh, the concentration of fine air particles, as you can see, is go higher, high, as high as 200 micrograms per cubic meter. Obviously, this is explained by the, uh, uh, the, the I have here the air mass spec trajectories, and you can see uh, they, came, they came from the Africa continent. And especially here on these two very high uh, uh, concentrations in late February, and that corresponds to these, um, to these uh, air mass spec trajectories that came from Sahara Desert. 
Um, but well, what was also very interesting was the amount of elemental carbon present in these samples. The elemental carbon accounts for up to 40% of the total carbon present in these samples. Well, this is, was very surprise, a very surprising result for us because usually in, in Portugal, in Aveiro, in Lisbon, the elemental carbon concentration is about 12% uh, of the total carbon present in the sample. So 40% uh, is, is very high. Um, well, this is explained, and the elemental carbon, as we all know, is a, a is as a primary origin from fossil fuel and traffic um, traffic uh, emission sources. So uh, this is explained by the fact that this sample location was uh, highly impacted by uh, uh, by traffic and by local anthropogenic sources. Um, this also explains why the organic carbon, uh, almost 50% of the organic carbon is of primary origin, origin, and also explains why we have such low values of water soluble organic carbon, that is this yellow, um, this yellow line here. And obviously, in terms of the contribution of the organic matter to the fine air particles, we have very low values when compared with the samples collected in Lisbon and Aveiro. Uh, we don't have a, a contribution higher than seven percent of the total uh, of the total mass of fine air particles. Well. With these results, the next step was to make an characterization of the um, of the water soluble organic carbon of the main structural features of this organic fraction. So I have here a few NMR spectra uh, from the samples collected in Aveiro uh, in winter and summer. I have uh, we have to we had to, we make um, an assembling of the samples according to different air mass trajectories because. We wanted to know what was the impact of the uh, of the marine sources and continental sources on this uh, organic fraction. So uh, this is very complex uh, spectra. I'm not going in much detail on this on, on the interpretation of this spectra, but, but uh, I'm also uh, only going to highlight that we have aromatic. We can divide this in different uh, functional groups, proton functional groups. We have here aromatic protons. We have the oxidized uh, aliphatic uh, groups. We have here these um, uh, these. Uh, um, uh, these peaks here, these bands, correspond to um, uh, uh, to um, uh, protons that are linked to carbons, to carbonylic, uh, to uh, uh, carboxylic uh, uh, carbons, and we have here aromat uh, aliphatic carbons here. Um, well, the most important difference between the summer and winter is the presence of the signals assigned to aromatic carbons. There are uh, much, the whose intensity is much higher on the winter samples than in the summer samples. Well, the next step was to uh, integrate each region and to make a SME quanti quantification of each functional group. And as you can see here, um, the aerosol samples are most aliphatic. Uh, up to 48% is aliphatic, uh, are aliphatic uh, uh, groups, uh, in, uh, regardless of their mass trajectories. Uh, another interesting uh, feature is that winter samples exhibit a higher aromatic content than the summer samples that are represented here, that on, uh, in summer samples up to 4.4% uh, is aromatic uh, groups. And summer samples, have uh, the highest con content of unsaturated structures. And actually, uh, most of them came from the north, the northwest, west. Uh, well, they have, this means that they have a, a very strong maritime uh, uh, influence. So the next step with this uh, data was to try to assess if we can discriminate the, the samples according to different sources. 
So um, this uh, source apportionment tool that was first uh, suggested by Stefano Di Cesare, that is today here with us, uh, is suggested that uh, these three regions, the uh, uh, marine organic aerosols, this region for secondary organic aerosols, and this region for biomass burning uh, organic aerosols. Uh, from this uh, first work that uh, uh, that used the source apportionment tool, um, other regions have been defined for urban organic aerosols for fresh biomass burning in pollen. So we decided to see how our samples fit into this representation. And um, most of the winter samples are clearly classified as urban organic aerosols, have a clear um, anthropogenic uh, and primary emission signature, whereas the summer samples clearly are more oxidized, um, that is, uh, and it is easily explained by the uh, high con higher contribution of secondary formation process to these features, to the circle features of these samples. Also, we cannot disregard the fact that the marine surroundings could also contribute to these samples. Well, in case of Cape, Cape Verde samples, well, this is a total different scenario. These samples exhibit a very similar structural composition. We can uh, hardly we can discriminate between the different sample, uh, the different sampling campaigns, and the relative distribution of the functional groups are uh, very similar uh, among the different samples, uh, with the uh, the lymphatic. Uh, groups contributed to up to 7% of the of the fe structural features of these samples, followed by the oxygenated olfactic groups, then saturated groups, and finally the aromatic groups. Well, we also represent and try to understand the the the, the the structural signatures of these uh, of these samples in this source apportionment tool is as expected most of them uh, uh, all of them are on the urban organic aerosols region and what was interesting is that we can uh, make a cluster of the samples collected during november um we are still trying to understand why these samples make a different cluster as a separated cluster from the from those collected in, fe in january and may uh, but Clearly, they are uh, um, they are uh, very strongly impacted by anthropogenic sources. So, uh, we uh, with these results, we move forward and we try to assess how these well, if they are very strongly impacted by anthropogenic sources, definitely if they, especially in, in Cape Fear region, if they if they uh, deposit on the top on surface ocean that def definitely may have an impact on marine biota. So our next step was to assess how the marine the, the what what is the effect of deposition of uh, urban uh, particulated matter uh, on uh, the marine uh, organisms, but. Uh, it is difficult to remove the organic, the particulated matter from the filter sample. So we made these uh, these, uh, these studies with the reference material. Um, uh, we uh, most of us know this kind of material that is used to, uh, particularly for analytical uh, development of, of analytical methods and to validate analytical methods. And uh, what we discovered uh, is that in terms of diatoms, there there is a, a growth enhancement, but in microalgae there is definitely a growth inhibition. Um, this might uh, suggest some impairment of primary production. On the other hand, no acute to uh, toxicity was observed in invertebrates, but we also exposed the polycates to uh, this urban particulated matter. And definitely this kind of material uh, may cause significant biochemical uh, 
changes on these marine organisms, not, not only, uh, uh, namely on the bio, biomarkers of uh, uh, associated to the oxidative stress and also to the anti, uh, antioxidant system uh, impairment. We also, um, with these results, we uh, also try to um, to characterize the levels of some of the elements in the, these polygates that were exposed to this urban por, uh, particulate matter and compare these results to uh, uh, control organisms that were only exposed to uh, artificial salt water. As a, uh, and we also compare these results to uh, the composition of this uh, um, reference material in terms of the element of its element composition. And uh, what is interesting is that the polygates are really uh, characterized, the exposed one, are really characterized by high levels of lead, uh, barium, um, also cadmium, cadmium, and aluminium. And uh, we try to understand if there is a, any possible bioconcentration of these elements. Uh, in the uh, polygates. And what we find is that definitely there is a bioconcentration of the zinc and iron, but also followed by arsenic, lead, and uh, copper. Well, and these results may uh, justify the sub lethal effects that we observed previously on polygates. Um, we also uh, um, tried to uh, assess what was the impact of the, the um, of this uh, urban particulate matter in other organisms. Organisms, and we also studied uh, CBAS juveniles, uh, the effects on organs of CBAS juveniles. But here, I, I just want to highlight what happened uh, when we uh, fed these CBAS, uh, CBAS juveniles during four days with polygates that have been previously exposed to urban particulate matter. And although we did not observe significant difference on the differences on the biomarkers, um, uh, on some of the biomarkers that signalize the oxidant, uh, uh, oxidative stress, uh, we did not find any difference between the organs of the exposed animals and the rest, the respective controls. Uh, there are some uh, antioxidant uh, activity on intestine, uh, intestines that may be related to the root of exposure uh, due to polygate ingestion. Uh, in terms of cellular damage biomarkers, uh, liver as, uh, shows a significant increase on one of the uh, biomarkers, which might suggest some protein damage in this organ. Uh, on the other hand, although some cellular damage has been observed, namely on liver and gills, uh, overall, the results should suggest little effect on animals that are fed with contaminated uh, food. But um, I would like to highlight one thing. We just fed the animals during four days. So the experimental period was too short uh, to perceive more uh, uh, pronounced effects, suggesting that we may need to um, uh, increase the, num uh, the number of days uh, in which we uh, um, expose these juveniles to uh, contaminated food. So uh, to um, summarize uh, the main results, main findings, uh, def definitely the sort of composition of the water soluble organic aerosols in Aveiro are, uh, are mostly uh, aliphatic. They, are, they feature a core with heteroatom rich aliphatics with both primary and secondary origin. The uh, samples from Cape Verde are, ex they exhibit a very strong anthropogenic signature. Uh, which is re probably related to local traffic emissions. Um, the urban atmospheric particulate matter may cause significant biochemical changes in polygate. Um, there are possible via concentration of these elements on the, these marine uh, uh, organisms, but 
obviously we have many questions ahead. So the future perspectives is to uh, keep focusing on the composition of marine dissolved organic matter on surface waters of different marine settings, try to capture the changes uh, that occurs um, in organic aerosols during settling through the water column, assess the influence of uh, potential internal and external divers on the composition of this organic matter, evaluate the ecotoxicity. In, in this case, we think perhaps the aged atmospheric particles might have an impact and might change the bioavailability of trace metals and also other organic pollutants. And definitely we need to assess the ability for trophic transfer upon exposure to a contaminated marine organisms. Finally, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, not only um, the funding institutions, but also uh, the host institutions, SESAM and the University of Cairo and the University and Nova University of Lisbon. And also, uh, I would like to thank Solas for, for endorsing and for contributing to this, uh, to the, to this project. And also, I would like to thank uh, Sandra Freire and Wadinga, uh, Wadinga from Tropos and Sandra from the University of Cape Verde, who were very uh, strong, uh, uh, very strong, um, uh, colleagues and very uh, very important to make this uh, to make the sampling campaign in uh, and also I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I don't know if uh, perhaps we should move forward on the to keep the to keep the 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 channel perhaps move forward on the uh on the on the presentations and maybe we can uh, uh leave the questions to the open discussion if that's okay uh i don't know if lily is still here and uh, also cheng cheng if you agree with me we should move forward that will be fine. yeah that will be fine Okay, okay. So, um, so our next talk is, will be uh, delivered by Wadiga Vomba from Leibniz Institute for Tropospheric Research in Germany. And it's going to talk about the atmospheric deposition of phosphorus and associated nutrient fluxes in the Northeastern and Southeastern tropical Atlantic. Please, Wadinga, stage is yours. You can share your screen and thank you for being here today with us. Okay, thank you, Regina. Also, thank you for the acknowledgement of the, of, the, of the task we did for the ambient project. So let me share my screen. Okay. So I don't know if you can see my screen now. Okay. So yes, we can see. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. As uh, Regina said, I'm Wadinga Fomba from the Leibniz Institute for Tropospheric Research. I'm a scientist here and. Today, I would like to show you some contributions that we have from the FOSMAP project on the topic of atmospheric uh, deposition of phosphorus and associated nutrient fluxes in the Northern and Southeastern Tropical Atlantic. Uh, this uh, work I'm showing, they are just current results. So they have not yet been published. We are working on putting them together for uh, next publication. And I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, the German Research Foundation for giving us the funds to carry out this project. Likewise, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contributions from the Kobabe Research Center, where we did most of the measurements, as I will show. 
So as you know, uh, phosphorus is a key nutrient for marine ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems. It's essential for the structural and functional components and also uh, for storage of information or routine functions of lipids or sugar metabolism. It helps the plants and for them to withstand the winter hardiness and increase the water use of efficiency. But the marine ecosystem impacts primary production and also species distribution and, and ecosystem structures. So um, it's a macronutrient which means it's very important for photosynthesis and primary productivity. So it helps in the process of photosynthesis so that the plants should be able to produce as much, as much energy as they can uh, during the process. And in case, and especially for phytoplankton and bacteria, they, it's very important for their metabolism. So according to uh, Redfield, uh, he said optimum primary productivity for phytoplankton or plankton uh, can be controlled by a certain proportion of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus ratios in the environment where the planktons find themselves. And among these important nutrients is phosphorus. Uh, and the phosphorus to nitrogen ratio, he believe controls a lot uh, the primary productivity in these regions. In oligotrophic waters, uh, uh, typically like in the Northeastern Tropical Atlantic, they are typically depleted with one of these nutrients, making bioproductivity not so much uh, efficient. Uh, yeah, so, but most often, where do they get their nutrients? So most often nutrients is being observed through river rime input into the oceans. But in the middle, in the open oceans, uh, atmospheric deposition could actually control nutrient availability or play a significant role. There have been studies that have actually looked at that and they have seen that phosphorus limitation can, uh, can be a cause of oligotrophic waters. There have been studies in the Red Sea or in the North Atlantic. And also some studies have uh, done some incubation. A lot of uh, incubation studies have been done with mineral dust and also with uh, different type of phosphorus sources. And people have seen that indeed there is a limitation of phosphorus that, can, that, that plays a significant role in marine productivity. In the Mediterranean Sea, they saw that actually uh, primary productivity could increase to about 35% due to the, the position of dust, uh, 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 phosphorus from dust. Uh, recently, there have been studies that have also indicated that uh, phosphorus from biomass burning uh, activities from Africa could be a source of, of nutrient to the Amazonas. But although there have been a lot of studies, there is still a lot of underestimation in the models of how important atmospheric deposition of phosphorus is. So uh, despite, uh, despite this importance and lack of knowledge, in some regions of the world, we don't have enough data. So like this is the recent review from Pan and Al that showed the availability of phosphorus data globally. And we see that in, in around the North, North tropical Atlantic or in the Atlantic region, there are not a lot of long-term measurements. Most often the measurements that exist are based on shipborne measurements. So snapshot measurements that can give us a good picture of what's happening at that moment, but it's limited in providing long-term access on variability and to elucidate certain sources and transport processes that can affect uh, phosphorus availability to the ocean. So due to this, uh, this, this motivation, we had uh, looked forward to work to improve the state of the art through the FOSMAP project, which stands for, FOSMAP stands for phosphorus speciation in mineral dust and marine aerosol particles by actually trying to quantify the amount of phosphorus in the aerosol particles in the northern, in the region around the northern eastern tropical Atlantic, which is the Cape Verde region, and also in a region in the southern eastern tropical Atlantic here in Namibia. So the idea was to quantify how much phosphorus 
is in the aerosol particles here that can contribute if uh, contribute subsequently to uh, primary productivity and see how much is here. The reason for Namibia is also because there is the Namib desert here. It's not a significant dust source, but it's also a mineral dust source. So the idea was to see if there is a big contrast in the composition of the dust that is subsequently deposited in the ocean. And after quantifying that and understanding the budget, we wanted to see if there are different forms of phosphorus that could play a role in these regions. If due to the enhanced uh, combustion activities in the south of Africa, if we have an elevated organic content of phosphorus that could be more soluble and play a role in subsequently in the ocean. So those other objectives were then to understand the sources of the phosphorus in these regions, uh, estimate their deposition fluxes, not only phosphorus, but also iron and nitrogen that play a role in marine productivity, and evaluate then the impact on uh, primary productivity in the north and in the south of uh, the Atlantic. However, this project started in the middle of 2018. And in the middle of the, of the campaigns, we were also in, engaged in COVID problems. So not all the measurements could be done, but we did, also, we did at least collected, we collected some samples for two years, so about one and a half year, which we, we shall be glad to show you some results. So uh, this is just a view of uh, the sampling locations where we went for sampling. So this is uh, the NDA, which is uh, the Namibian Atmospheric Observatory. Observatory. It's located in Kobabeb. It's an arid ecological institute middle in the desert. And this is a Cape Bed Atmospheric Observatory, the CVAO. It's uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. And that's where we collected samples for this comparison. We did, we did a uh, sample collection with a high volume sampler, a digital, and this is just a pictures, impression of how the filter looks like during, during different types of events, or dust or biomass burning or a combination of the both. So we ran the collectors in a, so in a three day sampling routine over a year. And in a one day routine when we had intensive campaign. We got, we, the, the, the first, the, these filters were then extracted using different procedures for the total phosphorus. We had to ignite them at 550 and then uh, extract them in SEL at a different pH to enhance a, a better complexation with the molybdenum reagent. We quantified all of the phosphorus using uh, the molybdenum blue method uh, and we used the procedure that was, had been stipulated uh, by a spiller, which is popularly used. And the absorption was done using a liquid wave guide capillary cell to enhance uh, detectivity because as you know, phosphorus concentrations in the atmosphere are very low. So you need very high techniques to be able to, to so very high sensitive techniques to be able to quantify them. So uh, the total inorganic, uh, Phosphorus was quantified using this approach, and the soluble phosphorus was quantified using an ion chromatography. So we just basically extracted the filter and then did an IC measurement. We also compared the IC measurements with the uh, liquid wave guide capillary cell measurements, and they were in good agreement. So we subsequently did the time series with the IC, and the organic phosphorus concentrations were calculated as a difference between the total phosphorus and the total inorganic phosphorus. So I would like to start with some with the budgets of the phosphorus we found and the forms of phosphorus we found in the different regions. In, uh, in the, here I showed the time series of phosphorus for one and a half years at both the Cape Verde Atmospheric Observatory in the middle of the North, Atlantic Ocean in the north and in, in, in the Namibian Observatory. What we see is that there is a strong temporal vari variation at both sites, but we observe that there are a bit lower concentrations in 
we observed lower concentrations in CVAO and typically at the decay trans limit of the instrument at the CVAO. Meanwhile, in Namibia, uh, we have a bit higher concentrations of, of, of phosphorus. The frequent peaks here were due to extreme weather events, most likely in the Cape Verde Atmospheric Observatory. This was mostly due to Saharan dust uh, episodes. And in Namibia, it was due to strong storms coming from the south, or also due to uh, when you had strong storms or strong winds coming from uh, Angola, where there is a lot of combustion, and passing through the city. So we had two scenarios, two strong uh, scenarios that dominated the phosphorus budget. The baseline in, in, in Namibia was around 12 nanograms per cubic meter, but in Cape Verde was less than one nanogram per cubic meter, indicating that uh, the aerosol particles uh, in the region of the Southeastern Tropical Atlantic may, be, may have elevated phosphorus compared to those in the Northeastern Tropical Atlantic. So comparing this to some snapshot measurements done by Baker and others, uh, the values in, Cape, in, in Namibia are significantly uh, 10 times higher. So we looked at the seasonal variation of the phosphorus budget at both sites. We had higher phosphorus in winter at both sites. So usually between December to, uh, to February, it's a dust season in Cape Verde, and that's why we had elevated phosphorus. There is a second phosphorus uh, increase in phosphorus in August, September, October in Cape Verde region. And this is also due to biomass burning and also uh, low level altitude dust that is being, being, uh, that is being, uh, is being uh, experienced during this time. Uh, the lowest phosphorus was in spring. Uh, that was mostly in, in, in Cape Verde in April. But in Namibia, we had uh, most of the, the lower, lowest concentration between May, June, and July, which is our summer. The high concentrations were at two times of the year, usually during the winter and also during the fall. And this was also due to differences in, in uh, the air mass trajectory, as I will show later. Indeed, if we have to look at what is the budget in phosphorus at phosphorus uh, at the two regions in the Atlantic, one would say that uh, the, in the monthly, if we look at the monthly averages, the budget in Namibia is about two to ten times higher than what we see uh, at the Cape Verde uh, in the Northern Atlantic. So we looked at the various forms. Here I represent the total inorganic phosphorus, total organic phosphorus, and soluble phosphorus at both sides. Also, strong variation. We see that most often the organic phosphorus uh, in the Northern Atlantic or in Cape Verde was always uh, high when there was uh, when there was also high uh, total inorganic phosphorus, indicating that both of them typically had the same source which means mineral does play a strong role also in the organic phosphorus contact here. But if we look at uh, the same trends in Namibia, we see that uh, the organic phosphorus was not always uh, peaking when we had high peaks in, in uh, inorganic phosphorus. If you look at the solubility as well, when you had high soluble phosphorus, it was not necessarily when we had always, when we had high inorganic phosphorus. So these differences indicate that there are different processes that could con control the different forms of phosphorus that we have in the atmosphere. And this can long-term impact their bioavailability when they are deposited in the ocean. We looked at the seasonal trends of the various phosphorus forms. The inorganic phosphorus had the same trend like the total phosphorus. Uh, the, organic, uh, the organic phosphorus show also two peaks, uh, so mostly one during uh, early spring and one during September, October, when there is a lot of combustion. For the organic phosphorus in, 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 in the Cape Verde region, there was no big difference to the inorganic phosphorus. For the soluble content, we had a peak solubility typically during fall, uh, during uh, 
August and September at both sites. And this is again, uh, as we'll see, related to a bit of combustion and different type of air mass intrusion in this region. So uh, just to make a comparison between the phosphorus budget and those that have been reported in the literature, uh, I would say the, 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 the black values are, are those from the Namibian, from the southern, from the south, and the orange values are those from the north. What we see is that the south, uh, the concentrations in the south, in the average, are typically higher than those in the north. And if we compare that to those to concentrations observed elsewhere, the concentrations in the, in the south are factor five in some cases, like in the total phosphorus, or in some cases, like in the total, in the soluble phosphorus, factor two or factor three higher than what we typically know about phosphorus from mineral dust sources in the Northern Atlantic, specifically from, uh, from, the, from the Saharan Desert. So then we looked at how soluble and how bioavailable can this phosphorus be that could affect bioproductivity. And the first thing we observed was that there is a strong relationship in the solubility and the pH of the sample. So here, I plot, I, uh, here's a plot of the fractional solubility against the total phosphorus concentrations. And they are coded in terms of the pH. So what we see, the, the blue pH means very low pH, very acidic particles. The red means more neutral particles, so a lot of carbonate. But we see clearly that there seems to be, especially in, 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 in March, in, in spring, so in, in spring and summer, you see when the, when the pH is low, the solubility of phosphorus seems to be higher. Similar in, in, in autumn and in winter, when the solubility is low, when the uh, so solubility is low, then the pH is very high. There was even a very strong linear regression we found between the pH and the solubility uh, in, in, in autumn, indicating that the more acidic the particles are, the more the easier is it for phosphorus to, to be released from the particles. So if the pH was less than 5.8, the solubility increased by 40%, especially in, in the summer and in the, in the, in the spring month. This was even stronger in, in, the, in Namibia than at the, at, uh, for the Namibian aerosol than in the Cape Verde aerosols. So we then looked at, uh, we then looked at uh, what would be the sources of, of, the so, uh, of the enhanced solubility. So here is a, is a plot of the solubility against uh, level glucosan and arabitol. Level glucosan is a good marker for biomass uh, burning and arabitol for fungus pulse. So we see exactly that during the summer months or during the autumn months when we have peaks in, in solubility, they typically correspond to peaks in level glucosan or in the arabitol spot. Even here during fall and again here during uh, the summer months, we see this strong correlation between solubility and, 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 and uh, combustion. So it means indirectly that the combustion provides uh, the possibility for more acidic uh, particles to be formed in the atmosphere that can then solubilize the aerosol particles and, and uh, let loose the phosphorus. So when we looked at the sources of the phosphorus, we, we started, I looked at uh, the organic phosphorus and here I, we did some evaluation between the organic phosphorus and organic carbon to see the ratio. If the ratio is always constant, it means you have the same source. And if the ratio increases, it means there is different type of sources that play a role. We compare this ratio with that from level glucosan to see if there's a high contribution from combustion sources for organic phosphorus and from with elemental carbon because it's also a good uh, tracer for combustion. But we couldn't see a strong correlation between combustion and organic phosphorus. 
what we found was that there was a correlation. There, there were some good indication between organic uh, phosphorus and mineral dust. So when we did the, the ratio between organic phosphorus and calcium, non of calcium, we saw some sort of good good coincidences, which indicated that maybe most of the organic phosphorus could be coming, <clears throat> coming from, from uh, organic matter in the, in the mineral dust. There were some incidences that other combustion sources played a role, but typically uh, uh, mineral dust and organic matter from the dust contributed highly to the organic phosphorus concentrations. For the inorganic phosphorus concentrations, we observed that they were strongly linked with the non seesaw calcium, which is a good indication of mineral dust. And the, the peaks in the uh, inorganic phosphorus were uh, coincided very well with the peaks in the PM10 mass concentrations, indicating that there was a strong correlation between them. Uh, we looked at the correlation between inorganic phosphorus and non seesaw calcium and inorganic phosphorus and fluoride. And we saw that especially in the months of, uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the autumn, there was a very strong correlation with an R square of over 70% between the inorganic phosphorus and the fluoride and the calcium, indicating that uh, they, this could be coming from mineral dust and spe specifically from the apartheid Appetite, uh, appetite uh, mineral, which is known to be a significant source of, of phosphorus in the soil. So we could conclude that uh, most of the inorganic phosphorus was contributed from mineral dust coming from apartheid. So we looked at the air mass trajectory to see how the different forms of phosphorus are being distributed, which, uh, air, which regions contribute to them. In the Cape Verde uh, region, we had, uh, for this time period, four clusters. We could identify four separate clusters, which I named them. Uh, uh, the first cluster one is uh, Sahara and Sahel, Africa. And the cluster two, I named it Europe, Europe and the Canary. And cluster three, the Atlantic. And cluster four, coastal, uh, coastal cities in Africa. What we found was that the total organic phosphorus was, was, uh, was about the highest was coming from mineral dust, so from Sahel and Sahara region. But we also had contributions from Europe and, and Canary making up, up to around 20% uh, of the total phosphorus observed here. The other sources made less, uh, contributed to, uh, to about 25%. Uh, 25 percent and 10, around 8 percent respectively, and the the uh, air mass coming from the Atlantic in the past also comes from North Af North America. So North American air masses at times succeed to reach the Cape Verde Atmospheric Observatory and typically leads to increase in trace metal con concentrations. But the soluble phosphorus we saw. Uh, a similar, a similar trend in, in the contribution of uh, the, the continent. But interesting was that the coast of Africa, where coming uh, around the coast, where typically during winter uh, air masses, during summer air masses arrive from, contributed more to the soluble, soluble phosphorus. And during this period, there is always a lot of enhanced biomass burning that uh, pushes the biomass burning plumes up uh, to the north. For dissolved nitrogen, there was uh, similar contributions from the clusters from for iron was dominated by mineral dust input coming from the Sahara. So uh, in the Namibian region, we had a different type. We had four clusters, although uh, clusters two and three look similar in their origin, but one plus the difference is that the inflow is from the south and the other inflow is from the uh, northwest. The contributions were different. Higher contributions uh, were usually when you have contributions from the strong winds coming into inland from the, from the ocean, coming to the inland, uh, resuspending a lot of desert dust here, 
and enhancing and elevating the PM concentrations. Uh, the cluster one was uh, typical for, for air masses passing through biomass, uh, biomass burning regions and also coming with strong storm. And this was the cluster that typically leads to deposition of, of, of phosphorus in the ocean. But what we can say is that there is contribution from biomass burning sources, mineral dust sources, and also marine, marine contributions that lead to uh, enhanced phosphorus concentrations. So finally, we looked at the deposition fluxes and tried to understand what is the impact on the ocean. We looked at the nitrogen and phosphorus flux, the ratio between them. Typically for optimum productivity, it should be about 16, but uh, atmospheric concentrations are typically higher, especially for nitrate. So the, the, nitrogen, the nitrogen phosphorus flux is were typically above 100 uh, in, uh, in, in the Northern Atlantic and typically below 100 in the Southern Atlantic. This indicated that we have uh, that we have enhanced nitrogen deposition in the north compared to the south, which could help to reduce the nitrogen limitation that is often uh, observed in the north. So atmospheric contributions play a significant role in reducing nitrogen limitations that that are strongly observed in the North Atlantic. So to look at <clears throat> the impact of these fluxes to marine productivity. We use satellite data from uh, uh, Copernicus Marine uh, Science and we integrated the chlorophyll primary product production at uh, in a 50 grid area close to the Cape Verde Islands to see if this region can actually, uh, if we can see impact of the deposition of the nutrients in this region. So here I present the fluxes and the impact on chlorophyll. So this is the dissolved inorganic nitrogen flux during the, the period. And this is the flux of phosphorus. This is the flux of, of iron. And this is a chlorophyll uh, con concentration that we, the surface chlorophyll concentrations that we get in the ocean. We can see that there are two, uh, during the periods of high deposition of the nutrients, phosphorus, iron, and also nitrogen in the ocean, there is an enhanced chlorophyll productivity observed in these regions around the Cape Verdes. This is both in the early winter, in the early months in January, February, where we have high dose, or even in the end of the year when the dust season is starting around November, December, we see that the enhanced deposition of these nutrients lead to an increase in primary production that we can actually quantify from the chlorophyll measurements. Finally, we looked at uh, the impact of these fluxes on phytoplankton groups. So we, in this case, we look at pico, uh, picoplanktons, diatoms, dinophagellates, and, and microplanktons. In this, uh, the correlations were not so good. We had just a few incidences where we saw that maybe uh, atmospheric deposition could play a role. And, but the conditions under which this could have happened and the time gap between the position and between the position and productivity is still something that we have to understand. But what we can say at the moment is that there seems to be uh, an impact on primary productivity and phytoplankton community from mineral dust deposition in the northern eastern tropical Atlantic. At the moment, we have not done such measurements in the, in the southern eastern tropical Atlantic, and this will be something that we will look for in the next future. So uh, I hope I will have shown you some main results that we've had. Uh, we have shown that there is a, um, a bias in phosphorus concentrations in the south compared to the north of the Atlantic. And these concentrations can affect primary productivity. The sources of the phosphorus are mostly mineral dust and combustion sources. And the solubility is mostly is strongly driven in the southern hemisphere by combustion sources. So with this, I thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take the questions after the next talk.
Thank you, Wadinga, for very uh, for this very interesting talk. Uh, uh, I think that since we are running a little bit uh, late uh, regarding our schedule, uh, perhaps you could, could leave the questions for the open discussion. And now we could move forward with the third talk from Stefano De Cesare from, uh, um, uh, from the Institute uh, um, of Atmospheric and Climate Sciences of the National Research Council of Italy uh, that is going to uh, present a survey of selected NMR results from past and ongoing field campaigns uh, regarding, regarding the characterization of marine aerosols. Uh, please, uh, Stefano, thank you for being here with us and the stage is yours. And, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Okay, very good. So this first slide is, is to just acknowledge my main collaborators and uh, I, among the, the foreigners I've quoted here only those involved in long-standing collaborations. So mainly the Institute of Marine Sciences in Barcelona and the National University of Ireland, Galway. And um, in my group, I, I need to thank uh, particularly Marco Paglione who was, was, was connected today. He has done, uh, he has taken over me in, in doing NMR research on marine aerosols. Um, but I, I'm presented today because I, I want to give you um, a summary of all the results that we have taken uh, in 20 years of research on, uh, with NMR on uh, marine aerosols. And, um, so I hope you will enjoy it, even if I will show a lot of NMR spectra. <laughs> so this is just to make it the context of my research. My point of view is from the, from the other side with respect to to the other two talks of the dates from the atmosphere. So what are the, what the, uh, the marine sources, uh, uh, how do, do they contribute to the, the, the nature and composition and characteristics of the atmospheric aerosols that we, we observe uh, over the, the, the vast oceans? I, I will not enter into the details of the, old, the processes that are involved in this field of research. I just I'm just showing here, here this beautiful picture that I've taken from, from the paper from, from Zhang Du in 2017. But uh, so the main research questions for me are uh, specifically what are the contributions of terrestrials versus uh, maritime sources uh, uh, for the aerosols over the ocean? And uh, what are the contributions of primary respect to the secondary source uh, to marine and natural aerosols? And what are the biological mechanisms that can drive the sea spray productions and form new particles? So these are, uh, again, um, it's another picture of uh, a high vol sample. We have, we have seen many of these uh, high vol systems today. It looks that uh, they are still um, trendy. And uh, we use uh, them for collecting uh, time integrated samples of uh, atmospheric aerosols so, um, over um, research ships or uh, atmospheric observatories. And um, normally NMR takes, uh, requires a certain amount of, uh, of uh, aerosol samples to, to be collected. So we normally run the sample for uh, several days also because we need to make sure to, to avoid contaminations from the from the exhaust of the ships and so on. But uh, with the new uh, analytical um, tools that uh, have been uh, developed with time, we can uh, record a reasonable good uh, uh, proton and MR spectrum with a sample load of about uh, 20 microgram of carbon or even less in deuterated uh, water, which is not that bad, even for uh, for measuring the marine environment. Then, of course, if you start to extract the, uh, the organic compounds from the water matrix uh, using a, a solid phase extraction, uh, you can also do more fancy things and uh, also do performing two-dimensional NMR. Re Regina here is a master in this field. I, I, will, stay, I will stay stick to the one-dimensional proton NMR for today. Uh, but uh, there is a one important point um, that is that I'm showing mostly data for, for the water soluble fraction of the, of the organic gas, but uh, there's a lot to do also on the water insoluble. Water insoluble and soluble are mainly operational definitions. They, are, they refer to the ability to extract these compounds from, from, 
from, from the matrix, which is uh, the aerosol itself plus the, the, fi the filter medium. And uh, we have explored uh, some extraction techniques using uh, trifluoroacetic acid, of course, uh, more standard uh, solvents like methanol or uh, chloroform is also possible. The problem with the organic solvents is that uh, they, they have to be real clean, for, and, uh, which is not that easy if you want to, to, to record good spectra at the very low concentrations. It's much easier using deuterated water. That's why I'm, I'm using it all the, every day. So this is uh, um, to explain the, the approaches uh, for um, uh, three basic uh, approaches that uh, you can follow to exploit uh, the information uh, of the proton and mass spectra of um, an, an ambient aerosol sample. One of the first approach is uh, using uh, NMR for uh, identifying and quantifying individual compounds. So um, like GCMS, for example, for instance. Uh, for some kinds of compounds, especially those in, present in ionic form, like amines uh, and sulfonates can, can be even more efficient than uh, GCMS. The, other, the second approach is uh, uh, about the analysis of functional groups, which is the, the very same approach that Regina have uh, talked to you about in, 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 a, in our very nice talk today. The third approach uh, is, um, sorry, is uh, about the, anal the analysis of the factorization. Uh, so just using a factorization of protocols like uh, methods like a PCA or a PMF and so on, and to try to, 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 to perform a spectral deconvolution of a, a data set of samples. So this paper here is just to make an example of, uh, of the first approach, uh, the analysis of molecular traces. Uh, the group of uh, Jens Sikora in, in Prague, I think it's uh, the, 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 the one uh, of the reference one today because they are applying metabolomic tools to, to NMR. And uh, I think it is very promising tool also for uh, very aerosol analysis uh, because it, it enables to, to resolve uh, a lot of overlaps of uh, complex resonances. So it's also, I think, a field which is going to, to, to to, to develop, to be developed in the near future. Today, I will tell a lot about instead the third approach. So I would say the, the methods of factorization. So you, you, the only thing here is that you need a, a certain number of samples, or spectra at least, to, to put into your matrix. And uh, our data sets could be of uh, a numerosity of uh, 20, 40, even 90 samples because uh, even NMR is becoming more uh, automatic with time, more sensitive, I think it, it's going to, to, to go into a more in, in analytical shape, for even for uh, environmental applications like ours. So uh, I, I expect some, some development in the future. What, what we do is uh, to, to use a PCA normally to, to get them, um, the best number of factors that we expect from a, a, a given data set and then apply non-negative factor analysis like PMF or MCR to, 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 to decompose the, the, the spectra into factors and contributions, similarly to what people do normally with uh, mass spectrometric techniques like AMS. So just going back to the origin, this is the first, I think, good, set, good spectrum from, from an ambient sample um, besides the, the few ones that I published during my PhD uh, in, a, in, a, in overland. So start, let's start from the content. It's the, the very good paper from, uh, from Suzuki in 2001, it's a seminal paper. And um, he used the uh, NMR mainly to identify some compounds. Uh, he have done it identified also the glucosan and, and many more compounds. But uh, let's focus for a while for, for, to the general shape of the spectrum, because uh, wherever you sample over land, you will encounter a spectrum of this kind. So with this very broad resonances uh, on the aliphatic and then some aromatics, then, of course, uh, the main trigger here is uh, the amount of biomass burning you have around. Because if you have biomass burning, then the aromatic band increase quite a lot. And also the, the band of a poly also where the levocosanese gets higher. And that's the main uh, 
uh, factors triggering the variability in the spec. But uh, be, make, be sure that this kind of spectra you will encounter quite frequently when, when uh, measuring the, the submicron fraction of the aerosols uh, over land. And if you go to the supermicron, we'll get the pollen, other th well, it, it full diversity of stuff. But the, for the submicron, this is quite typical. And um, how, how do you get this kind of uh, um, compounds? Well, uh, outside biomass burning, one uh, source, main source, believe it to be the, uh, the oxidation of terpenes and uh, the other vox. And um, the, the, here I have a contrasted one spectrum from an ambient sample. This is from Malpeth, but it's very similar to that uh, found by Suzuki. And I contrasted it to spectra from uh, samples taken in the, in the smoke chambers uh, and um, at several inf infrastructures in Europe and US. And you see that the none, of, none of them really get the ambient sample right, but the, the overlaps between them tend to uh, reconstruct uh, the, these broad resonances that we especially found in the aliphatic region of the spectrum. The reason why we get that broad band is that uh, most of the uh, soil forming compounds are branched, the cyclic uh, compounds, uh, they tend to form this complex mixtures of uh, functionalized uh, compounds, which are uh, normally very highly branched uh, and um, in cyclic compounds. So they possess a lot of methines with respect to methylene. So CH with respect to CH2. And this makes a difference for uh, HNMR, as we will see in a minute. And uh, this sort of uh, spectra characterized by this very broad band. So normally call it like humic-like. Let's uh, uh, consider it uh, uh, purely spectroscopically defined, uh, hulic, without uh, really implication for the actual molecular weight of these compounds. And uh, they are found everywhere, uh, normally in the original background uh, in polluted areas. In, uh, during the the series of the small short free campaigns in May 2008 in the frame of Yukari project, we, can, we could even follow this, these materials uh, flowing from Hungary to Germany and to Germany to the Netherlands, and eventually from the Netherlands to the May Sad in Ireland, even so to the, into the Atlantic. Just the same stuff uh, traveling across Europe for more than 2,000 kilometers. And then eventually it goes to the ocean. So these are our main fingerprints of uh, uh, water soil organics, which uh, from the land goes into the ocean. So this is our reference spectra for, for the anthropogenic when we are measuring in, the, in oceanic areas. And uh, so then, then we go to, to Mayset, which is one of our main stations at which we collect most of our data about the marine aerosols. And uh, here I have to note, of course, the group of uh, Colin Adaud and uh, our colleagues there, Darius and Jurgita. And, um, um, my colleague here, uh, Matteo Rinaldi, has done a lot of work in connecting the, the fraction of organic um, compounds in, into, the, into the marine aerosol with respect to sea salt and connect it to the, the chlorophyll and the source aerosol in the, in the North Atlantic. But today I want to make, uh, to give you a, an, NMR spectra, an NMR perspective of this. So let's back to, to May 2008. So what, we, what happened at that time is that uh, for the first uh, a couple of weeks, we had this transport from, from the, uh, Europe, from Europe that what we have seen uh, uh, two, two slides ago uh, before. And with this kind of spectra with very broad bands in the aliphatic region, which we call it a kind of hulis. And then at some point there's a transition of uh, into a very different air mass. So they, they essentially the winds rotated from east to west. And so at some point starting from the three of June, we start to, to, to see really in, in clean mar marine mass. It's clean in, in the, defined by the amount of black carbon, which is measured here. So what, what we found there in terms of organics, we'll, we'll, we will find there a, a residual pollution maybe coming from North America or something else. Actually, the second is true because the NMR spectra in, this, in, the, in the background marine atmosphere is has nothing to do with anthropogenic compounds. It's a spectra of a, of a completely different shape, which, have, which has nothing to do with the hulas. If we go, if we look at it in more details, we see some individual compounds, 
the main the main player is of course methyl sulfonate, which is which was found a long ago. It is always there. Then maybe some other sulfur compounds, maybe a little bit of SOA, methyl tetraoxide is not confirmed. But the main main things, main patterns of a, of a, of a spectral regions is given by these guys here. So these are mainly resonances from uh, methylenes in, uh, in inserting into linear structures, so highly functionalized with the oxo group uh, and uh, carboxylic groups. Uh, so these are essentially the, the linear the dicarboxylics or oxocarboxylic acids. The, 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 the number, sorry, the numbers in the box are the, the, the average chemical shift uh, uh, corresponding to these uh, functional groups. So the fact that the carboxylic acids uh, occur in the aerosol is, a, is an old story already cover more long ago, I found it very, very clearly. Probably in this kind of compounds, uh, the simple oxalic acid uh, accounted for a lot of carbon. It is just that with proton MR, we cannot see oxalic acid itself, but we, but we can find uh, the, the, their homologs. These are not uh, really individual compounds. These are families of compounds. So there's a really a mixture of them, but uh, this is essentially the, the main uh, uh, family of compounds that is characteristics for this kind of samples. And uh, then uh, some more samples from uh, Mesa. This uh, was another project called MAP. Um, it was uh, it, it involved also research uh, crews uh, um, off offshore Ireland, and then um, at that time we 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 sampled the aerosols in Maysad over the ship, uh, and uh, uh, in Maysad when the, when the air mass is coming from from the east, uh, from, from so from UK and Europe, we found this kind of hue spectra. Whereas from the ocean, uh, we saw different things, and basically at that time we saw a lot of amines. The ethylamines, uh, the dimethylamines, sometimes the trimethyls, and so on. And uh, also, normally in these kind of samples, we see more aliphatic compounds, which could be even different classes of amines, aliphatics, uh, other aliphatic compounds that we have not really identified with uh, great accuracy yet. And uh, during the same experiment, we performed the uh, bubble bursting uh, productions of experiments uh, in, into a tank uh, on board the, the, the Celtic uh, uh, research um, ship. And uh, the, this, the, if you uh, look at this, the spectra on the left, uh, the, the three on the bottoms are uh, for the insoluble material extracted into trifluoroacetic acid. And uh, the two on the bottom are from seawater, from POC, and from a colloidal POC, so pre-filtrated on a membrane of 10 micron in a porosity. And then uh, this, uh, the, the two on the tops are for the bubble bursting aerosols. So the, the, the water, the water insoluble and the water soluble. So essentially the water insoluble is uh, uh, formed largely from this, the, the aerosolization of this colloidal material that we see here which is uh, highly uh, contributed by lipids and from some uh, polysaccharides. Uh, we, we didn't see a lot of proteins. And what we get in the soluble, essentially, it's probably a little bit uh, of this, but with a much shorter change, of course. The lipids are not uh, soluble per definition, but some aliphatic compounds, or probably some uh, low molecular weight fatty, ac fatty acids, uh, Get, in, get into the water extract, uh, and, and, and this is our fingerprint of uh, primary aerosols to be used to, com to compare with the, with the ambient samples. And, uh, so this is an example of a, a, a water soluble organic carbon uh, sample from, uh, again, from MESAD, it's again ambient, air, ambient samples, with a uh, very different from the ones that I show, we have shown before, so not really the MSA, not the amines, but uh, more aliphatic compounds, uh, which could be uh, related to the, um, to the processing of fatty acids. So these are mainly low molecular weight fatty acids uh, and uh, they are degradation products like, like azelaic acids. So um, we, we managed to find uh, uh, evidence of uh, com organic compounds that we, we attributed to primary organic aerosols during our uh, measurement period in, in May said Island. And um, this, this kind of compounds could also be extracted by solid phase extraction characterized by 
two dimensional uh, NMR and uh, in, the, our collaborators in Crypt also did some LCMS analysis uh, and found the evidence uh, confirmation of uh, the, 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 the presence of uh, linear aliphatic compounds related to fatty acids uh, also in these samples. By putting all these samples together and making some factorizations, we managed to resolve some general classes of compounds in the water soluble organic carbon in the samples from ASAD. So there are two outliers, which are those uh, contributed by the transport of pollution from the continent. And then there's a large diversity of compositions in the, in the, in the clean marine samples. And now one main factor is related to amines and, uh, and uh, methane sulfonates. And the other, step, and the other uh, factors is instead related to the, the moral fatty compounds. So that, that we attribute to contribution from pri primary marine houses. And then if you dig into that, you find even more, more things like this one. If you, if you sample in summertime, you may say you start to get this kind of uh, uh, spectra there on the bottom, which we don't know really what it is. The, the most uh, closest thing that we have found is, is from the chamber experiments where from uh, the terpene SOA, and then it, these are spectra are characterized by a lot of these uh, saturated uh, oxygenated compounds. We could even uh, contribute to the things that uh, Regina have, uh, found, have uh, showed today in, in, from Portugal in the summer. So there's more there that we cannot really relate to amines or uh, sulfur compounds or whatever. So that's more to, 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 to understand. Then in the last part of my talk, I will move to the to, to the polar areas, uh, and uh, I start from the Arctic. Uh, this is the, the, um, the village of uh, New Alazund in the Svalbards, uh, and um, CNR ran permanent observation at the Groove Badet Laboratory, which is uh, somewhat uh, uh, outside the town. And there we, are, we started to, to organize regular samplings of uh, PM1 uh, filters for uh, NMR analysis. Um, just to give you a context of the, of the research, uh, there, is, there was uh, in the recent years we have seen an intensification of uh, chemical organic chemical characterization in, in the Arctic, and this is a very nice paper from uh, from Moscow et al. So um, coordinated by the Paul Scherer Institute um, in Switzerland, and I was showing that the uh, anthropo anthropogenic in winter time and, and natural sources uh, in uh, in a summertime, trigger the variability of the organic composition uh, you know, over a, a lot of coastal sites uh, uh, around the, the Arctic Ocean. I, um, we have now um, we are now running uh, uh, analysis of uh, the third uh, full years of uh, continuous um, uh, sampling in uh, New Alison for offline uh, NMR and also AMS analysis. What I'm going to show here is just an extract of, of this. This is just for the, the pre campaign performed in June, July 2018. So, very small set of samples. What we get is uh, mainly two factors for uh, NMR. Uh, um, factor one, which is high in June, then goes down in the middle of the summer. And factor two, which is actually ramping uh, in, in the middle of the summer. And this second factor here is actually. Again, close to very close to the old spectrum of by Suzuki at all. So this is mainly anthropogenic stuff, and it's peaking in the summertime because of the uh, transport of uh, wildfires, uh, aerosols from from Siberia, reaching the, the Central Arctic. When, when instead we go to the first factor, the biogenic, then uh, let's split this into uh, two sub factors, and uh, uh, the first one is very close to what we found in May SAD uh, in May 2008, is again uh, related to this uh, family of uh, uh, decarboxylic acids, uh, uh, highly functionalized and oxygenated, uh, again with some uh, sulfur compounds around. So it looks that um, during this uh, measuring period, uh, um, measuring period, um, New Alison really uh, you know, behave like we said, even if the environments are very at, are at very different latitudes. And um, the, the other factors found in uh, in uh, New Alison is this one, which is uh, also biogenic, but it's completely different from from the previous one. This uh, compares uh, 
relatively well to samples of um, sea spray uh, um, from, from the tank experiments. Here I, I'm showing a, an example from the, the Pegaso campaign. This is Antarctica, I will, I will tell you in a minute. But just to show you that these kind of samples are very much contributed by these uh, aliphatic compounds here, uh, enriched of uh, methylenes, uh, and also some sugars and polios. Uh, even if the, this, the spectra from the, from the tank experiment also contains you know, other compounds like uh, osmolage, which are not really fine or found in the aerosol. Um, but this kind of feature uh, for us is uh, more related to the, to the primary aerosols, to the bubble busting aerosols, which also apparently are also around in, a, in New Allison, well, after the, the sea ice melts, melts down. So to the bottom line, it looks that uh, our data set provides a confirmation of the whole idea of Kabomuras uh, that uh, the, the fatty acids uh, uh, processing triggers uh, a lot of the, the variability in composition of in the atmospheric aerosols over uh, oceanic areas. And uh, through a really a long chain of uh, um, chemical reactions, uh, uh, cutting down progressively the, the length of the, the chains uh, of these linear chains uh, and making them more functionalized, oxygenated, and so on. The only things is that uh, our data do not really uh, clarify um, where this processing actually occurs, whether in the aerosol or partly in the gas phase or even in the micro layer. And um, who knows, even uh, why not in a, even in the surface uh, waters? Uh, themselves uh, even mediated bi uh, biotically because uh, certainly uh, fatty acids and other aliphatic compounds uh, can also be uh, made more complex by, by free enzymes and, and the, the other heterotroph and the heterotrophs in the water. So can be emitted even already somewhat com complex in complex forms into the house. So this, I think it's, it's a field that to, to be investigated in more, in more detail. But uh, the, there's, we are full, I think we are full of evidence of the occurrence of this kind of compounds. Uh, uh, these are, are from, even from uh, other uh, methodologies, this is this from uh, aerosol mass spectrometry. These are data from the NetCare program in the Arctic, so the Canadian program. And again, we see evidence of uh, uh, linear uh, di 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 diacids. Uh, um, again, in the Arctic, so this is completely, this is completely consistent in what we see in a New Allison, essentially. Less, a few, just a few slides about the Antarctica. Here I have to acknowledge the Manuel de Losto and Rafael Simo in uh, the group of uh, the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona. And um, I have a time only to, for, for a rapid uh, survive, uh, survive this in the research that started uh, about uh, six or seven years ago. And um, one, uh, one main uh, research uh, line was uh, on, on the effects of the emissions from the biota in the, in the um, colonizing the sea ice. And we found that uh, this biota actually contributes a lot to that secondary aerosols dominated by sulfur compound and also amines uh, in, the, in that part of the world. But uh, in that frame, we also performed some more uh, detailed NMR uh, analysis. Uh, we perform the tank experiments on board. And uh, what we get, uh, I mean, here it will take uh, too much time, but uh, in, in really in a few words, uh, we can see that uh, a lot of the, the compounds, which are characteristics of uh, um, the POC in, in, in the surface water, do not, does not really go into the air. So, I mean, the, most of the amines uh, are not efficiently aerosolized into PM1, uh, um, the PM1 fraction of the aerosol. Then if you go probably to PM2.5, PM10, you get different things. But in the very, very fine particles, uh, we see some alanine, some amino acid, but in very small amounts. Uh, most is a little is from the sugars and polios. Uh, and uh, a lot of these compounds that we don't see in POC must be in the, in the solid form and they're rich in the, in the micro layer, uh, which is related to, again, these aliphatic uh, groups, uh, uh, aliphatic compounds, uh, Mm, including uh, low molecular weight fatty acids uh, and uh, more complex uh, forms of, the, of this. And uh, if you compare it, the bubble busting errors to the ambient aerosol, we see evidence of these aliphatic compounds uh, very commonly. 
in that part of the world. So I'm, I'm telling about the, the, the Weddell Sea in the Southern Ocean uh, toward Argentina. Argentina, and we see a lot of polios uh, with a lot of uh, specific compounds that we get also in the, in the tank experiments. And again, these uh, lymphatic compounds here. And uh, so basically, again, these guys and overlapped on them a fraction of uh, secondary aerosols, mainly amines and, uh, and um, <clears throat> vitamin sulfonate uh, and some, uh, some more stuff here. Uh, from our soil compounds, uh, which uh, we don't know exactly what they are, must be oxygenated. And um, just to tell you that uh, we have performed more experiments again uh, involving the in the frame of the experiments coordinated by the Barcelona group, uh, uh, more detailed bubble busting experiments uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula. I will skip this. Uh, and uh, just to uh, as a final slide. Uh, we, are, we have performed a, a systematic measurements of uh, um, aerosols uh, uh, in parallel at the two stations from the British Antarctic Survey. And here again, we thank a lot uh, the, our co-workers from the BAS there that they taken the samples in uh, harsh conditions for our, our, uh, for our collaboration. I think the samples, the results are very nice. I do not feel uh, authorized to show really data today because the presentation is recorded, but uh, I think uh, the results, uh, say in, put in a few words, show clear contributions from uh, the secondary uh, marine aerosols and also this uh, from local sources and uh, a lot of these primary aerosols contributed by the molecular weight fasciates and polios, which occur at the same times at two stations which are 1,000 kilometers away from, from each other. So these uh, primary aerosols produced by sea spray apparently are distributed over vast regions over the Antarctica. So they can survive over long range transport, uh, essentially uh, unimpacted by atmospheric process. But this is something that we are investigating in more detail. So getting to my conclusion, I think uh, we have got, uh, in, uh, say, um, indisputable uh, evidence of uh, the importance of uh, biogenic sources uh, for, for the composition and, and the chemistry of uh, the, the submicron fraction of the aerosols uh, over, over the ocean. And, um, and now in, in some areas, we see a clear transport also from, from, from the land, land sources. Uh, and this is especially true for, for the mid latitudes and the Arctic, but not really in the, in the Antarctica. About the secondary aerosols, uh, we have a contribution from the amines and the MSA, probably more stuff uh, that we have seen in MESA that is still to be characterized, but uh, a class of compounds uh, connected to the, the extended degradation of fatty acids and, uh, and um, being present a kind of a mixture of uh, decarboxylic and oxycarboxylic diacids is always there. We have found it in the North Atlantic, the Arctic, uh, but less importantly in the Antarctica. And, and everywhere instead, the contribution of a primary aerosols in very clearly in, in Antarctica over vast areas. I'm talking again, more than 1000 kilometers plus vast. Then of course, a lot of is yet to be done in terms of improving the analytical uh, techniques. Uh, there's a large overlap uh, of uh, the resonances even using high magnetic fields. Uh, I think that uh, the metabolomics uh, uh, approach uh, proposed by the Prague group uh, is, uh, is very promising. Uh, we have still to, to, to really develop uh, a, a, an affordable uh, a protocol for uh, the insoluble uh, uh, fraction of organic carbon the aerosols uh, at the very low concentrations. And then uh, for the seawater and the surface uh, microlayer analysis, there's still the problem analyzing uh, the, the solar organic matter without extraction, because um, of course we can extract part of the organics from the, the so from, from seawater, but uh, taking the, the full uh, uh, pool of organics, including the, the, the thritarionic, uh, those in thritarionic form or, or ionic, other forms of ionic, it's very difficult using SPE techniques. And, uh, and this is especially a problem in seawater where uh, carbon is normally in, uh, measured in PPB and uh, in sea salt is 3.5%. Uh, so this is clearly an analytical challenge for NMR. And um, okay, I will stop here and uh, look forward to uh, your questions. Thanks. 
thank you, Stefano, for this very interesting presentation. Obviously, <laughs> for uh, as you can easily imagine, I, I, I'm very fan of Proton and MR. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, let's move forward for the last part of the, our seminar. Uh, perhaps we are going to surpass the, the, our uh, time, but um, uh, I, I think we have some questions here on the chat. Uh, but please, if you have any other questions, uh, please raise your hand and uh, um, we are here to uh, clarify uh, uh, your question. So let me see here first, um, um, here on the chat, uh, Santiago Gasso, I don't know if he's still here. He is put here a question regarding the impact of CPAS. If uh, this uh, uh, work has been published uh, uh, anywhere, no, not yet. We are going to, we are uh, still working on this, but uh, we are uh, working also on the manuscript. So hopefully it will be published uh, soon. Um, so more questions for what thing I think, let me see, um, from uh, Zongbo Shi. Uh, uh, Wadinga, uh, he has asked it about the, can you comment whether the relationship between nutrient deposition and higher chlorophyll is casual? Uh, yes, so, uh, hi, Zumbo, long time no see. Uh, yeah, the first question is that we didn't calculate the pH, we measured the pH. So, it, we actually extracted the aerosol particles and and uh, from the extract of the aerosols, we measure the pH of the extract. And the second part is, um, if it's a casual causal relationship, I can't really say. It's just an observation at the moment that we see, and the correlation seems to be uh, seasonal. So we don't see it in all the seasons. And so we think it might be causal, but that is still a speculation. It's just an observation at the moment. We, we are trying to do other experiments to elaborate on that, to actually track a dust source and also do measurements around the ocean close to the observatory to see if we can really see a baseline increase during the event in order to answer if it's really causal or, or not. So at the moment, uh, it's just an observation and I can I can't say for sure if it's causal. Okay. Uh, we have here another question for also for you, Wadinga. How is the pH calculated? Uh, I said I measured that. I didn't calculate it. We just uh, okay. extracted it and we measured it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I, ask, uh, I also have uh, one question. Uh, you show the correlation between uh, organic phosphorus and the organic carbon, if I'm not wrong, uh, and you don't, uh, you concluded that there is no correlation. So the organic phosphorus is more correlated to biological sources, right? If I understood uh, correctly. No, so I showed a ratio between organic phosphorus and okay. organic carbon. And I saw that, and we observed that the ratio changes during some periods that are not typically related to combustion period. Okay. So I would have expected if it was a relation with combustion, we would have seen that when the ratio between the organic carbon and the organic phosphorus changes, the combustion ratio also changes. But we didn't see that so strongly. So that's why I thought uh, maybe combustion is not the main source of the organic phosphorus. Okay. Um uh, do you think that perhaps, well, th this is something that uh, came up uh, when I was listening to your talk. Uh, uh, do you think that perhaps um, it could be any correlation with the, uh, because you show, you have showed results regarding the soluble phosphorus? Yes. But the soluble phosphorus is like uh, organic phosphorus or total phosphorus? What so, do you? Yeah, so we didn't differentiate that. 
So, but I think uh, uh, from the from the contribution, I think it's mostly inorganic phosphorus. Okay. But we didn't we didn't do any sequential extraction to see the contribution of organic phosphorus to in the soluble phosphorus content. Okay, and do you think that might that uh, phosphorus upon uh, after um, uh, after the position could be like an uh, an important uh, 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 not a food source but a nutrient source to the microorganisms on the ocean surface? Do you think that could uh, well you showed the, the 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 relationship with the chlorophyll, um, but uh, um, so uh, do you think that could be like a, 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 a pump that stimulates the marine uh, marine production at least? Yes, yeah, so that's the hope. Uh, that's actually the hope is the question we would like to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the data we have on hand, they are satellite data. We don't have institute data that we measured, which we can actually uh, proof or, or have more evidence to say that it's a stimulus. But we, from some other limitation measurements, people have shown that it's a stimulus. And from the first observation we see with respect to chlorophyll A, we think it could be a stimulus. But there are other oceanic processes that play a role during this, uh, during this time. And we are the next step we are trying to see is if we can differentiate the baseline from the new new primary production. So the next step we'll try to do is to estimate the new primary production and compare that with the deposition. Uh, but unfortunately, we we are we are we are we are limited to satellite data. And in the region of the Cape Verdes, we have only level three data and not level four data. So certain uncertainties on that on that in the data acquisition needs to be considered, but uh, we hope we hope that we can still with the level three data evaluate the, the new primary productivity with the phosphorus fluxes. Okay, uh, we have here another question on chat from Francis. Uh, Nohama, I think it's the right way to, to say. I, I think it's for you uh, again, Wadinga. Uh, with the observations in the northeastern and the southeastern Atlantic, can you comment on what might be the case in the central eastern Atlantic? Uh, yes, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need some measurements. <laughs> that's the good thing. <laughs> In, in field measurements, because you, you you can keep measuring and measuring, and they keep and and the yes, but but I think um, in the in the central eastern there will be more there will be more soluble and uh, more organic phosphorus, uh, just because uh, why do I say so? When we have biomass burning episodes, when we have air masses coming from coastal Africa, which is around the central. Or if we have air masses in Namibia coming from central to south, as I showed in the first cluster, we typically had elevated, elevated uh, organic phosphorus content and soluble content. So I, 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 will, I will just uh, speculate and suggest that, um, that in the central Atlantic, you have a higher concentration of soluble phosphorus. If that will play a significant role in the marine bio, uh, in the in the primary productivity in that region, it's a second question because there you have a lot of coastal input because you have a lot of erosion from the central from from the equatorial region that uh, produce a lot of uh, of that provide a lot of nutrient from from erosion. So it will be something to see which one is dominant, but for sure, yeah, I think you have higher soluble phosphorus in the central eastern Atlantic. Okay, uh, so uh, any more questions for uh, Wadinga regarding the, the, the deposition of uh, and the atmospheric flux of uh, phosphorus and associated nutrients? 
well, just I have just one question. Did, did you find any um, any source or at least uh, any results of the influence of the uh, anthropogenic source emission sources uh, on the African coast near uh, the simply near Cape Verde sampling location? Because as you saw in my presentation, the, the local emissions are very strong <laughs> there. So yeah. uh, any association with uh, regarding the, the phosphorus? Uh, no, we have not. We are still look. We are we are in the process of doing a PMF to see if we can identify source signatures that we can associate to various activities, mm -hmm. and we don't expect to see so much at the CVAO. The reason is because uh, the CVAO is quite north compared to, mm -hmm. to 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 Santiago, where mm -hmm. the measurements were done, and in that northern attitude altitude, uh, we don't have any island in front of okay. in front of the CVAO. So the air masses coming to the CVAO are only long range transported air masses that are far away from local uh, local activity. Oh, local activity. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so um, more questions here. So um, Stefano Di Cesare has one question yes. for me <laughs> about NMR data. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> now, I was curious about uh, the source apportionment of the compositions uh, of the samples from uh, Cape Verde because, in, in, I mean, it's an environment uh, very interested per se. And um, one uh, main thing, one main comment from based on my experience that uh, um, at some point, uh, we we realized that uh, the the compositions of the marine aerosols can be very variable and very diverse. So, uh, uh, and, and I'm not completely sure that uh, we can use uh, that small sectors in the in the functional group diagrams to to really acknowledge that diversity of compositions. Mm -hmm. For it, because uh, I I given some examples today. Even some uh, um, aerosols of populations in the in the in the clean marine air masses can be really aliphatic in compositions for different reasons, uh, which are do not relate to anthropogenic sources. So, but if you want to really to to make a split between the anthropogenic and the marine sources, based on my experience, uh, it's better to look at their concentration, the, the amount of aromatics. Because mm -hmm. uh, the NIST uh, sample standard uh, the spectrum is very aromatic. Yes. And um, there are a lot of uh, possible mechanisms leading to the presence of aromatics in the sample from uh, when anthropogenic sources are around, and very few possible from the biogenic sources when you, you look at the, the very small particles. Then if you go to larger particles, start to get uh, proteins. And so then it's become more complicated. But for the small particles, it's difficult for, for the yes. biogenic uh, processes to produce aromatic molecules, whereas it's very easy to find them from, from the anthropogenic yes. source. So yeah. if you want to stay with the functional group approach, uh, I think uh, you should have a look also the aromatic uh, proportion. And uh, because when we produced the, the functional group diagram, we had only a few of the samples from the marine aerosols. But afterwards, we have seen that you can find very different populations of marine particles there in the, in the yes. Atlantic. Yes, I show that results, but I, I agree with you. Uh, and um, more than looking at the aromatic, we are also looking to the to the, uh, to the NMR, and uh, definitely uh, we see. Uh, the uh, different signatures that are not specifically related to that kind of uh, that source regions that I have identified in 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 the diagram. Uh, so, but uh, I chose the, the, the those diagram particularly for Cape Verde because uh, uh, there is a, a not a correlation, but it definitely agrees with the content of elemental carbon and very low content of water soluble organic carbon in these samples. Definitely they are impacted by anthropogenic sources. But again, I agree with you, it's more 
um, is uh, more accurate to look at the, each functional group and try to see in each functional group, like aromatics, if we uh, are able to identify source signatures that definitely uh, allow us to uh, correlate with specific sources in that particular uh, region. Yes. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, Lizolette Tinel has a question for you also, Stefano. Uh, do you think NMR analysis is very complementary to MS data for this type of samples? And of course, the observation of the similar increase in low molecular weight oxidized fatty acids in Antarctica is very exciting. How sure are you of the sources of these aerosols? So, first question, uh, how this compares to the MS fingerprints? Uh, um, um, that's why, so to clarify that, uh, we have started to, to, to run uh, MS and MR uh, in parallel more systematically. For instance, for the Arctic samples, we are doing uh, uh, MS offline. And, uh, a lot of samples have already been uh, uh, analyzed this way in the Whole Share Institute uh, labs. And uh, this is a paper we are working on. So there you can compare. Uh, then you can do the PMF, the factorization uh, in the two data sets and compare the contribution of factors uh, where they overlap and, and uh, where not. I think that uh, AMS is more uh, powerful in uh, clarifying the, the, the chemical classes. Uh, uh, seg segregate in terms of oxidation state, uh, functionalization, and so on. But uh, for the less processed uh, uh, compounds and MR, I think it's more able to, to keep track of the original structures of the compounds because it, it does look at the CH bonds, but as uh, AMS is very sensitive to the oxygen. But uh, the carboxylic acids, uh, the, I mean, the carboxylic groups is not uh, really specific of any groups of compounds. Whereas in the, if you look at the carbon skeletons, uh, as uh, NMR is able to do, you, you, you should be able to, 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 get, to extract more information about the original structures of the precursors. Even if at some point you, you, you simply get lost in the complexity, but um, the, there are some chances to, to, to detect a lot, a lot of classes of biogenic compounds. And about how, how, if, if I'm sure or not, uh, that that's depend on uh, our libraries of uh, reference spectra. And this, there's, there is clear a problem in, uh, because uh, relevant libraries are uh, available uh, even to a limited extent, uh, especially for biomolecules, so simple biogenics, but as the, for the, the oxidation products, there's not much. But um, some people working us in the smoke chamber have started to, to record and publish even more systematically chemical shift data also for the, the oxidation products. And this is something uh, kind of, of work that they will become, uh, I think, relevant at some point. But for the moment, uh, my reference spectra are just uh, uh, the, the results from the tank experiments for the bubble busting. And then, uh, for instance, uh, uh, there are samples uh, clearly impacted by certain sources like the transport of uh, wildfires uh, or anthropogenic uh, products, which are our endpoints in the, in the composition space. And I use them for, for interpretation. Then in the middle, there is always something that uh, you just cannot interpret. Yes. Um, any more questions? Uh, I'm checking here if someone has, has raised a hand, but I don't think so. Um, so uh, one comment question for you also regarding NMR. Um, Okay, uh, we agree that uh, NMR spectroscopy does not parallel uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, for instance, there are some mass spectrometry in terms of the, the level of information that can be, uh, uh, that can be acquired, uh, at least uh, when we are talking to online techniques. 
topics, okay? We are talking here about different things. Uh, but from your point of view, do you think that the NMR could be viewed as a routine technique when we want to assess not specific sources, but specific, um, uh, specific um, uh, events uh, or uh, a chain of events that could change uh, the characteristic of, of aerosols and, and could uh, allow to explain uh, how these events as an influence on of atmosphere on the atmospheric behavior of these, of these particles. Well, uh, I have to say that uh, AMS uh, is clearly superior to any other chemical characterization of techniques for the aerosols when run online. The problem is that. Uh, are we able to run online NMS in remote areas uh, all the time and where? Clearly, it's difficult to, to run NMS uh, routinely in a very remote, remote place. And um, mm -hmm. that's why uh, a lot has been done on uh, running AMS offline. So just bringing it there in high volume that anybody can uh, operate, then taking the filter back and uh, analyze them. And in that case, NMR can rival with the MS and being complementary with that, just as LCMS or GCMS, whatever. But uh, every, every different techniques can, uh, can be suitable to, to, to provide information a certain part of the, uh, on a certain shape of the chemical composition space. But um, so I think that for remote places, uh, NMR as like as MS can, can be very informative. Just because we cannot really, we are limited for operating uh, uh, online uh, uh, chemical me measurements uh, uh, in such in such places. Some some are trying uh, a CSM uh, uh, tough, uh, but you need a particle concentrator because uh, there's a power sensitivity. Yes. So it's it is not that uh, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. So since. Uh, the, the old high wall systems are still an option in such places. Yes. I think that uh, this makes uh, opportunity, provides opportunity for uh, offline MS, NMR, or whatever you like. That's my yeah. point of view. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, it's, it's sometimes it's a, it's a, a fight that I, that I have with <laughs> some of the reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I totally agree with you on that <laughs> on that matter. Um, uh, Regina, I have a yes. question for both of you. What is okay. the minimum constant, uh, mass that you need to run an NMR aerosol mass? Do you have a limitation in terms of mass, or uh, if you have uh, typically like you have remote particles with very few five five or 10 micrograms per cubic meter, can you see from such concentrations run an NMR spectrum from a filter? You said five micrograms per cubic meter, it's a lot. That's a polluted area. <laughs> 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 it would be a, a dream to have a, yes. a aerosol concentration. So At least level. our dream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, really, um, as um, I presented this uh, in my slide, we can get down to 20, 20 micrograms of carbon per sample, uh, even below. But it depends also on uh, how clean is the, the matrix or the filter. Uh, what, so you need to do some test, uh, but uh, we can get that uh, sensitive um, with the indeuterated water. Whereas mm -hmm. for the methanol, uh, chloroform and others, uh, uh, I would need uh, somebody in the lab happy to, Distillate the solvents, uh, this kind of work that I am comfortable to start, honestly, but uh, <laughs> some, maybe some in the future I will make. Yes, uh, well, just to uh, add to your comment that I agree with, uh, well, for to, uh, to perform to the NMR that allow us to look into the substructures present, so to the NMR give us um, uh, informational more than functional groups, how they are associated within the molecule. So we can like starting putting the, the pieces of a puzzle, you see. But for in that case, we need, for instance, the information on carbon. And well, we are, when we are going to that kind of study, we need more, uh, more amount of sample. Um, yes, at I least kind of a, a milligram. 
Yes, we are talking about milligrams in terms of carbon. So when we want to make a 2D NMR, we sometimes uh, we start to look at the samples in terms of seasonal variation, and we assemble the samples uh, because uh, uh, okay, we need to deal uh, with the, uh, the loss of information in terms of daily variation, for instance. Uh, because otherwise, uh, if the if the, the study location has very low concentration, uh, then uh, for two DNMR, we need to increase the amount of sample. Down, I, I completely agree, Regina. But if you have, if you have already characterized the site for uh, its climatology, you can uh, program uh, specific samplings even for the less sensitive NMR techniques. Mm -hmm. But uh, then instead, if you go to for an intensive field campaign, then you, there is a trade-off. You either uh, prioritize uh, time resolution, and then you run only the low sensitive techniques, uh, and, or the high sensitive techniques like uh, one-dimensional uh, proton MR, or you get only one or two big samples for the low sensitive techniques and uh, 2D NMR. So for the field campaigns, there is a trade-off. For, a, for a, um, an observatory where you have uh, continuous access, you can, uh, I think there's a, there are opportunities to do, to do both. Yes, totally agree with you. So um, we uh, already two, 25 minutes ahead of our, of our uh, time. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone else would like to make uh, a comment, a question? Um, I don't think so. We don't have anything else on chat. So, um, well, from my side, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to uh, make my uh, personal and big thanks to uh, Wedding and Stefano for uh, being here and for participating and um, and for, for, for your very interesting uh, and motivating presentations. Uh, I hope also, uh, I also would like to, uh, uh, to acknowledge and to, to thank our colleagues from Solas, Lili and Cheng Cheng. Uh, and also, I, I, I think I, I saw here also uh, Jesse, I don't know. Um, and um, for your support and uh, the organ and the help in the organization of this seminar and also for endorsing Ambience project. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would like to also to thank to all participants that uh, were present in the beginning and are still following us even now. Uh, um, and oh, uh, my, uh, my wish is that we came up motivated uh, to explore the, the, every possibilities uh, regarding the, the coastal pollution challenges uh, and look, moving forward to the sustainability of coastal areas. So um, if you have any more questions after this, please uh, free, uh, feel free to send them to me or Lily or to Cheng Cheng or directly to Adinga or Stefano. I, I believe they are more than welcome to, to clarify your question. And um, uh, thank you all for, for participating and uh, for being here. Um, and hope to see you soon in the next seminar, <laughs> solo seminar or conference. <laughs> Hopefully uh, not online. <laughs> and uh, I wish you all the best and all success for your future uh, research goals. Thank you, guys. Thank See you, you, Regina. Thank you, Lily. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank bye you, everyone. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.